Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of UED ABC Design Thoughts. I'm going to be talking about missions 7, 8 and 9 from episode 1, which is Biting the Bullet, uh, the Trump Card and the Big Push. You might have noticed that I have a bit of a mix-up here, insofar that Biting the Bullet and... Uh, the trump card are actually switched between the vanilla game and the UDIP. That is because biting the bullet is about a zerg attack that happens that makes sense only if it happens after you have actually already used the uh, psi meter. Because there are no zerg while you are fighting the confederacy in the trump card. But there are Zerg in the, like, on the same planet in Biting the Bullet. So the in game vanilla order of Biting the Bullet and then Trump Card makes no sense. I think it was just uh, maybe temporary or maybe the lore used to be slightly different back uh, when it was implemented in this order. But uh, if we actually like try to find some uh, reasoning, uh, between the events that happen, I think biting the bullet has to be the second mission in this order. Uh, and then the big push is after biting the bullet uh, at a different location, which makes sense. Uh, so let's start with the unmodded version of the trump card. Uh, it's a really obnoxious map insofar uh, that there's kind of enemy units spread everywhere. Uh, they aren't necessarily doing anything, they just kind of stand there menacingly. Uh, you start with this weird tutor like tutorializing location where you are being shown that you can lift off buildings uh, because there's a tank that shoots at you from up there uh, and if you don't lift this off you're going to lose it. This is kind of weird for, for two reasons, because uh, it's mission seven in the normal campaign, uh, seven in UDIP obviously because we swapped the order between this and biting the bullet, so this is like mission seven always. And you already have an island map before this. Uh, so this feels like a pretty weird place to show that liftoff exists. Uh, this is not necessarily like super bad. Uh, it's not like super distracting, it's only a short sequence. Uh, it just feels a bit light in my mind. Uh, and it's also, for me personally, uh, the fact that they already have like a base here uh, and you have Kerrigan in this weird spot is a bit of a narrative clash because they are supposed to be ambushing you, but because they start with this base and those bunkers, it feels like it's not that much of an ambush. It's kind of like Kerrigan just walked in with those two buildings uh, below those cliffs. Because obviously, like in the in-game reality that we have, if you build your buildings this close to enemy bunkers, they are going to be attacked. So it's a bit of a clash between what the gameplay shows and uh, what the narrative is supposed to be. I tried to remedy that a little bit in UDIP, uh, which we'll see in a few moments. Uh, there aren't many locations on this map. Uh, this is all for the tutorial. Uh, those marines uh, are... Those marine locations are not used at this moment, I think, uh, because those are normally used for units to enter bunkers, but you don't have any units here, so the bunkers just start out empty. It may be the case that uh, it used to be that marines are nearby and they enter bunkers immediately, but they got rid of that because it was too annoying or maybe it was too hard for really new players to escape with that science facility. Um, you have another bunker location here. You have the main AI location somewhere. Where is the main AI location? Oh god, where is it actually? I have to see. First two, Beacon. Okay, so this is the main town. That makes sense because beacons are buildings. Uh, beacons are invisible as well. 
So there's the added benefit of not being able to destroy the AI completely, although it doesn't matter in this map. Because if you could destroy the beacon, you have already won. Um, so it's like completely uh, inconsequential. What's a little bit weird to me is uh, the amount of units doesn't really jive well with what the AI wants to do, I feel. Because huh, it's a little bit awkward. Uh, for this mission, I think I would like, uh, if I was like a Blizzard designer 20 years ago, uh, I think I would like to have more factories and a little bit more buildings. Because what the AI does is that it defends buildings. Uh, it defends factories. So if you had more of them spread all over the map, it could uh, put up some resistance as you're moving through the canyons. But now what happens is it's just going to have those singular units standing there. Uh, you're going to kill them without much uh, trouble. And after you do kill them, it's just a short walk to the main AI base. And once you reach the main AI base, it has only one of each factory, which is not necessarily enough for it to, to put any kind of resistance. So what players end up doing in this map is really often they just use the starting science vessel. Uh, they use a defensive matrix on Karagan or the SCV and they immediately walk to the beacon and win the mission because you don't have to kill anything to actually win. So it's just a non-mission almost because no one actually plays it. And if they do, it feels like it wasn't made to be played in some way because it's so raw, you know, it's so kind of unfinished compared to uh, everything else. At least that, that those are my feelings on it. You can see that this is like very chaotic, right? You barely have any structure to this base. You just have 10 supply depots. Uh, this looks like a fun made campaign map that somebody would have made in 2001. And as a result, there's not really much to talk about, except uh, what I've already talked about. One more thing that I could mention is that the AI script is kind of cute. It tries to use a lot of raves, but in very small amounts. Uh, so what I mean is that it has like an attack of one rave and then an attack of two raves in a short time span. But unfortunately, because it's such a small amount of raves, it, it's not really going to do anything scary. Uh, it tries to research Yamato gun, but it never actually uses it because, as you can see, it has no science vessels. So <laughs> it's just kind of a misfire on all at all angles. But still, it's interesting that it could use Yamato if it did have that science facility. Mm, it's kind of interesting that it's trying to use raves and combine them with other units because that's not something we see all that often from other Terran AIs. It's just a shame it's not really used to the full extent that it could have been used to. Moving on to the UDIP version of the map, I wanted to have a little bit more of a direction while I was working on this, so I picked a particular um, idea of the AI I wanted to work with and I just focused the map around that and that idea was that I would have a lot of scripted sequences uh, that would be the confederates trying to do something that's just annoying to you because you have all these canyons you have a lot of kind of opportunity to, for them to like try to set up an ambush or uh, try to set up some fortifications and to this end you can see that there's a lot of uh, zones where they will try to build a turret, they will try to place siege tanks, they will uh, try to even like place some siege tanks above your mineral lines, which is supposed to uh, make you be prepared for a similar sequence that may be used in future maps. Uh, they will try to place some Goliath, some Vultures. Uh, if you just let them take parts of the map, they will put units there and they will uh, make them a lot harder to get through. Uh, the beginning sequence, instead of you just having a science facility and a 
uh, starboard, I think, uh, that you have to get away is instead focused uh, on the Confederates taking out your main base, which is what happens in the lore, uh, is that you have a Confederate ambush on the main base of Sons of Kohal, uh, and you're kind of fighting back from that position. So what happens in the AP is you have those yellow Epsilon Squadron units, they take out uh, some of those missile threats and uh, buildings, and then they drop a ghost here, and the ghost enters the uh, communications hub, and it just takes control of the this entire base. So this base actually becomes uh, oranges after a minute or two into the map. This is this is unavoidable. You can't do anything about that as a player. Uh, in fact, I kind of made some awkward. Uh, uh, I took some like measures to make sure that you can't ever do anything, and this is why you have those doors on each bridge. Uh, you can't leave, uh, you can't support this base in any way. Uh, if you try to go around here, this is actually too far for you to do anything. And if you try to lift off, it's actually, it would take you too long to be able to stop the ghost. Uh, so this is very deliberate, you're not supposed to do anything about the ghost. Uh, I know that's a little bit awkward in some sense, because uh, it's just a static um scenery piece that you can't really do anything about but i think that's fine sometimes uh, sometimes you just want to show something in game i think it's better to show this via an uninteractable cutscene uh, that happens while you play uh, than it is to just have a throwaway dialogue line that doesn't show absolutely anything it just tells you what happened at least that's my personal preference hmm. I'm pretty fond of how this map ended uh, looking like because uh, the canyons, the like the trees, uh, there's a lot of places where you could try to do some weird turn on macro, uh, micro with uh, ghosts behind trees or tanks behind trees or just utilize uh, high ground in some clever manner. This is kind of cramped, this is also deliberate, it's not supposed to be very easy to build around this location. Uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of doodads, it's pretty hard to navigate with like large mech groups. This is so that you maybe try to use some raves, which raves are also going to be really good about, uh, really good in terms of killing the siege tanks that I've mentioned earlier, uh, where they will be dropped below or above your base. Uh, if you want to, you can also go by on this map, you can go for ghosts on this map. Ghosts are going to be a little bit harder because you are on two gas and it's very hard to get the fire one. The fire one is here, but this location is going to be heavily contested. Uh, so it's not necessarily something that you can uh, count on taking early on. As a fun fact, uh, those three ghosts used to cause a bug where the transport would never leave this location because this cliff is small enough to where uh, our pathfinding transport detector thingy that we have so that the AI doesn't drop uh, on locations that are too small for it needs to navigate uh, was just making it impossible to enter this area. So <laughs> I don't really know if that's a fun fact, but it's something that uh, was really annoying to me and uh, we had to spend some time on trying to fix that. And by we, I mean that uh, our programmer in Nave had to spend some time on code solutions and I had to spend some time on trying to figure out whether there are any other instances of this happening. And there were, but we'll get to them in the Protoss campaign maybe. Mm, I like making these like weird asphalt based turn bases. Uh, it just uh, it reminds me of maybe huh I think there was one old campaign where uh, turn bases used to look like this almost every time and I thought it's pretty funny. Uh, I think it might have been uh, either the flame knives or the sequel. Uh, because it's just like, you don't really need 
asphalt to build structures in terms of how structures in circuit look like because you have this like huge uh, landing pads on them but you still have asphalt but you don't really have cars i don't know it's hard to explain it's funny to me uh now that i'm trying to say it out loud it doesn't really make any sense though <laughs> Hmm. So what happens on the map? Uh, there's the intro sequence that I've talked about. Uh, you get attacked through all of these bridges. The enemy attacks are pretty big. Mm, you get hit with like 10, 20 marines early on. You get hit with Goliaths and siege tanks. You have Kerrigan, so she's pretty good at dealing with uh, siege tanks because she can just lock them down. You have Wraiths, which are pretty good with dealing gas, uh, with siege tanks, and then you have siege tanks on your own, which, as it turns out, siege tanks are also pretty good at dealing with siege tanks. So you have ample tools to deal with whatever the enemy throws your way, for sure. Uh, you even can deal with battle cruisers, which they do eventually uh, attack you with some small numbers of battle cruisers. Uh, but you have lockdown, and you might have actually seen battle cruisers in the revolution, because battle cruisers are also used in the revolution map. Uh, if you let uh, Duke take enough expansions, he starts pumping out uh, like one. Well, pumping out one battle cruiser, <laughs> he starts producing battle cruisers in small amounts. Mm, so you might have been familiar with them, but in this map they do also research Yamato, which I don't think they do in that previous map. Uh, and if you are going to see Yamato, you might be pretty shocked in this map because Yamato deals AoE damage, so that's pretty new. Uh, that's something that didn't happen before. Uh, and that's also something that you're only going to see in vanilla uh, in the manner that it does work. Uh, I just wanted to make Yamato a little bit more distinct, try to explore how could it look like if it was more of an AoE nuke instead of a single target nuke. I think it's it ended up pretty satisfying to use, but it's also pretty obvious that uh, the way you need spuff find in StarCraft it's hard to actually get a good hit off. But when you do, uh, and when you like slaughter 10 Marines or 7 Goliaths with one Yamato, it's pretty nice. Uh, this map used to be, and probably still is, even though I kind of nerfed parts that cost this, uh, but this map used to be a huge... Uh, what's the term in... Uh, the term, actually, the term in <laughs> would be... A uh, term in is a Polish word, so <laughs> that I'm just saying in a weird way now. Uh, the term is a showstopper, I think. Uh, it used to be a map where if someone was new to the project, but kind of got through the previous six maps, uh, maps, and, and they started playing this one, they just would fall flat. Uh, they, they couldn't beat it. And I think it's because the uh, harassment used to be pretty... It used to be a bit earlier on, uh, and if you weren't prepared with raves immediately, you could definitely lose a lot of SCVs if you took this base. Uh, and that really made people scared, because I think they must have thought that this would keep up like uh, throughout the entire map. It doesn't actually keep up throughout the entirety of your playthrough. It's just a scripted sequence that happens once or twice. Uh, so if you learn after the first time and you prepare some methods to deal with this, uh, you are going to be okay. Uh, you will have to figure out a way to uh, either land some units up on this cliff or go around this via air or anything like that. You may use dropships um, that you can pretty handily build because you start with a starport. Uh, because this is obviously walled off, so you can't uh, move units between those two areas. But after you deal with the siege tanks, I think this is a pretty easy map. Uh, it's easy because you have many bridges, and you are Terran, so you have siege tanks, uh, you have uh, raves, it's, you have bunkers, it's just really easy to defend. Uh, and after you amass a force that's big enough, or maybe you deny enough resources from Orange and he starts uh, being unable to support his army, uh, it's rel relatively easy to enter this base from almost 
any side. Uh, maybe it may be hard if you go like mass rave and you are trying to instantly go to the middle because there's a lot of missile turrets. But I don't know. I I, did, I feel like raves are strong enough to where those missile turrets don't matter if you get an economy that can support a rave army. Uh, and after you like destroy or his base, it's really easy to just walk in with Karagan and the Siameter and plant it. Uh, the part where you don't really need to kill anything to plant the Siameter didn't change, but obviously the base is much harder to get into because of bunkers and uh, spider mines and missile turrets. So it's uh, pretty hard to just walk in with Karagan. It's doable within like the first few minutes. Uh, if you try to rush out a science vessel. Mm, but there's a small thing that uh, tries to disincentivize you, disincent disincentivize you from doing that. And that is, uh, if you walk in Karagan within the first few minutes, the next map is actually going to be harder. The rationale is that you are leaving uh, this location you are like abandoning it before taking out the communications hub and the confederates are going to use the communications hub to mm, like uh, convey information about your forces to other confederate squadrons that are currently on the platform uh, you fight on uh, during the big push so that's just like a small flavor uh, slash bank slash uh, convenience really thing that I wanted to do to make the speedrun have a little bit of a price. I'm pretty happy with how it works out. Mm. It's one of those things where uh, people feel pretty strongly about it, even though I don't think that it's necessarily the biggest deal. But uh, it works <laughs> anyway. The power generators, you might notice them in some maps. Uh, I think I've talked about this once uh, in one of the other episodes, but they are basically just a cheat uh, so that I can save a lot of space on supply depots because the power generators actually give a lot of supply. It's like a 20 or 30 or something like that. So. Uh, I use them and I don't have to have 20 supply depots in one place. Yeah, like you might have saw, you might have seen in the original map where you just have 10 supply depots. Obviously, if you destroy them, uh, the AI is going to have to build those supply depots, but uh, by then maybe you have damaged it enough to where it doesn't need that much supply and uh, it's not going to be like a monstrous amount of them. It is everything for this map. Um, I think it might might be actually about everything I have to say about this. Uh, the AI has an expansion here so that uh, it's not as binary in terms of economy. Normally, if it only had a base here, uh, the only way you could damage the economy is if you were close enough to kind of try and win anyway. So this smaller base is slightly, it's well defended still, don't get me wrong, but uh, you can go to it uh, along the top edge of the map if you take out this base. Uh, you can drop some units pretty easily here and you can try taking out this eco with a couple of vultures and it's going to do some eco damage, which is what I want, right? I want you to be able to uh, try to take a or risky like harassment route that may be useful to make the AI uh, slightly slower, take away some of its resources. If you do attack this, uh, the AI is going to respond and to respond it's going to be taking units away from here. So attacking this top uh, expansion is also a good way to soften up this uh, main base. Let's move on to Terran 8 now, which is biting the bullet. Biting the bullet starts you out with possibly the worst geyser placement you will ever see in StarCraft. Uh, it's 
so far and the worst thing is even if you take this base that seems like a natural expansion you don't have a geyser here so you are going to be stuck on this one faraway gas for a while and you might probably need to build a command center a little bit closer to this so that you can actually mine some Vespin. Uh, you can actually also build a command center and float here. Uh, there are some birds egg, as you can see, but uh, it's like it's possibly a better way of making sure you get more income than building a second command center just for this gas because here you also get some minerals, obviously. Those Zerg will not be reinforced, so actually if you do decide to take this, uh, it's pretty easy to uh, hold it, uh, hold on to it. Uh, this base will be reinforced, but it only has one hatchery, so if you take that out, it's going to be undefended afterwards. This base is what you have to destroy. I think you have to get this hive, and after you do destroy this hive, uh, like a fleet of nine scouts and gun fever. Uh, spawns, or maybe it's just a normal carrier. Uh, in any case, some protoss spawn in this location. Yeah, it's the gun future. It's two carriers actually, and some scouts. Mm. And once you get them, the only thing that's left on the map is going to be this. And this is just a, a huge ball of uh, proposed defensive structures. So this is pretty annoying to get into, but because you do get carriers, it's not going to be that hard. It's just going to be a time sink because obviously you are going to lose some interceptors and you're need, going to need to wait for them to rebuild. So it's just a game of chicken at some point. Mm, this AI won't really fare too well against anything because it's kind of broken. The script is really bad. Uh, the middle one is also kind of broken. Or maybe, hmm, I'm trying to think. I know that they are both really similar and they are both unfinished, uh, but they are probably less broken than some of the uh, difficult scripts that you may see in the custom content. What else happens on this map? Not much, let me tell you. Uh, I know that's been a consistent theme where I open a unedited map and say that not much happens on it, but that's just the reali reality of things. You don't have anything scripted, you just have a bare bones AI. Mm. You have two locations named Zerg Landing Zone. Let's see if they're used for anything. No, they are not. Oh no, wait, I'm lying. <laughs> oh god, I'm going to have to include a screenshot of this. Uh, but it seems that... I wonder if this is the original map. I have... I found this in some... Uh, some pack of unused StarCraft content. So I, I don't know for sure that this is unedited. I don't remember this, but apparently, uh, once Desator arrives in this Zerg landing zone location, you get a spawn of like 20 Zerglings and some other stuff. Like it's a lot of it's a lot of stuff. Um, I'm not sure that this is intended to exist, but I don't. I I'm not actually able to open the original map because. It crashes a CM draft. <laughs> uh, there was some way to try and open it, but I don't remember how. Uh, so we are going to have to live with this for now. At least I'm fairly sure that the bases are more or less unedited. Uh, and if they are, it doesn't matter because uh, they weren't super complicated to begin with. Pretty weird location. Maybe this is edited. Well, the terrain is the same, at least. <laughs> There's definitely an island, and you can tell that the terrain is the same because uh, this terrain is also used for an Enslavers map. I think it's like Enslavers 1, 3A, something like this. The map where you uh, can rescue like a group of Protoss in a base here. They're like locked in a cage and you can rescue them and if you do you win them up. You start that map with 
uh, Magellan and Tom Kazanski, which have like a combined HP of uh, 2000. So you can just fly them in immediately and win uh, without doing anything, which is pretty funny. Mm, let's move on from this because I don't know <laughs> what else I could say. As always, it's just a map. It's not very complicated. Uh, there's nothing really that happens outside of the ending sequence. Uh, and by ending, I mean where uh, Tassadar spawns and comes in with his scouts and then you just win. The AI doesn't have anything special uh, for that occasion. It keeps doing its own thing, except if that uh, trigger that exists in this map is actually in the original game as well. It also spawns a lot of units, uh, but they are not trained. They are just spawned by force on the map. In the UEDIP version of Biting the Bullet, we don't spawn units. Uh, do we even have that location? Yeah. Oh no, we don't. We have an area town in its place. Uh, area town is an AI location that just takes control of some buildings. Uh, so this is like separate base uh, from this. And this is a separate base uh, from everywhere, everything else as well. You can see that there's a lot more less uh, static defense. There's more static defense here, but this is a, a searcher brute uh, location. And if you play it uh, NORAD 2, you might remember that the searcher brute is a, a bit particular insofar it destroys its own buildings over time. So uh, as the map progresses, it's very likely that it will have less uh, static defense than what it starts with. It will try to rebuild some though. This uh, location will actually be taken by blue after some point. Uh, you also see that there's a Protoss AI and this Protoss AI does expand to this location. Uh, there's some dialogue about this. Uh, you have like two new pieces of dialogue that mention the Protoss on this map. Uh, the Protoss attack you with a small force early on, uh, but then Afterwards, they mostly attack the Zerg, and after you destroy Blue, uh, if you haven't killed the Protoss, which is something you can decide to do, uh, there's that dialogue from Tassadar, except this time he doesn't spawn 10 scouts for you. Uh, this time uh, the yellow AI just starts help helping you, and it has like a little bit of a helper, I think, so that it's a little bit more sturdy after it allies with you. So if you're playing the map in a way where you don't take out yellow and don't take this expansion for yourself. Uh, you get some help from the Protoss and they get reverse. This is your first time seeing reverse in UEDIP and reverse are pretty good against Zerg as it turns out. So he's hopefully going to help you a bit. It's still possible to lose because Orange is really angry after you take out Blue. Uh, Orange like swarms you with a lot of Zerg. Uh, he uses Hero Zerglings, which is devouring ones, they are pretty destructive. They can like instantly kill groups of marines almost. But uh, if you have any army that you can actually bring over water and you try attacking together with Tassadar, you are probably going to deal with uh, Orange. And if you run completely destroyed by the time that you destroy Blue, it's very likely that you are going to be able to run orange out of resources because uh, he does like slow down after a while. After he attacks you for a bit, he starts having resource problems, which was something I wanted to do so that you aren't like locked in this endless state of orange attacking you and you being unable to push out, which could happen if you went marine only i think or like marines and tanks and you tried to bring them over water uh, and then you got you had all of your dropships destroyed you were in a really bad spot and you could like lock yourself in this weird state when neither side can really win and it takes a lot of time for you to try to do anything it was a scenario that came up pretty often so i tried to do something about it uh, 
what also games uh, comes up pretty often in this map is that it's another one of those showstopper maps, uh, meaning people start playing it and it turns out to be way harder, way harder they, than what they bargained for. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. I don't think it's like a massive difficulty jump from the previous maps, uh, but uh, still I did a lot of things to make it slightly easier, hopefully. For example, we can see that uh, this island is slightly exposed by the starting fog of war setup. So you can see that there's an expansion here and you can hopefully figure out that making a command center and lifting it over there is a good idea. You can lift off barracks and land them over here, which is also a really good idea. It gives you a really early access to this expansion. Uh, you can take this base really early on with Duke that you still have. Duke is really insane. Uh, he has like 200 damage, so he can two shot Sankens, he can uh, instantly kill Hydras, he's really good. You can take this base with just Duke and Raynor. And it's not going. It's like not going to bring them to low HP. So if you want to spend your micro on that early, it's something you can do. You also get a gas, uh, but it's still this one is still very far away. <laughs> it's something that's so funny that I kind of wanted to keep this. Uh, so you still have that awkward choice that if you would want to build a geyser here or build a command center it's almost always better to instead go here but since you get this base and this base does have a geyser this time around it's also like a better natural expansion because you can take this and actually get some gas and from that point onwards you can only get to protoss by land uh, to you have to make some dropships to land here, uh, which this is supposed to be easy to land onto because it doesn't have any creep or any buildings or any sunkens nearby. Uh, and if you take out blue, which is a little bit hard because he has ultras and he has queens and he has hydras, uh, he's going to be pretty scary. But if you do take him out, then the sequence with Tessadra happens and you can fight against orange. And orange gets angry, like I said. Uh, what's special about this map? Uh, I think this might be the first map where... Oh no, it's not the first map while you f where you f fight Guardians. But it's the first map where, where you find Hero Zerg strains, definitely. I think it's uh, unclean ones and devouring ones that show up. So uh, hopefully you, you do get accustomed to the idea that you can meet some Hero Zerg and they might be more scary than normal ones. And unclean ones have an aura that deals some damage and do have an auto attack and the warring ones are just like uh, very fast zerglings that regenerate health faster and have some more HP and damage and ignore armor I think. Mm. I'm going to take a look at the script to see if there's really anything else I want to say about this map. Let's go Vanilla Terran 7. Some attacks are scripted to hit specific locations. I've mentioned it uh, early on in the first or the second episode. Uh, like you can see that this is an attack target for example. And this is a, a preparation area. So they are going to prepare an attack in this region and then they are going to hit this factory most likely. This is done so that some attacks are predictable and if you fail one time you can go in a second time knowing that some things will happen in a similar way. This is obviously not necessarily foolproof because you as a player will not be aware that uh, this is like a 100 reoccurring attack that always happens the same way. Uh, but hopefully if you like really struggle with this map, but you still like playing this mod uh, and you play it like two, three times, it's uh, a pattern that you are going to recognize and uh, you can like prepare uh, ahead of this particular attack happening and minimize it so you can find an advantage in some other place. 
Uh, what else happens? There's some script weirdness. There's like some uh, script commands that I don't use that often, but uh, they don't really. Uh, they aren't really easy to notice as the player, so I'm not going to talk about them. I think there might be some hydras behind trees here. Oh, maybe no. Wait. I feel like this is a place where I would want to hide a hydra behind a tree. But apparently not. Maybe I wasn't feeling like it that day. Maybe here? Oh, there is something here. Where is it? Oh, there's a zergling. <laughs> okay. Oh, there, there is a hydra behind the tree. Okay, that's that's good. I did have some sense. Okay, there's three of them actually. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. That's more like me. Let's move on to Terra 9, which is the big push. Terra 9 has this kind of interesting idea where you have this brown AI and he almost exclusively builds uh, light units, which light in this case means like marines, vultures, wraiths, firebats, just units that don't have a whole lot of HP. Uh, and you have this heavy player, uh, and he builds almost exclusively Goliaths, siege tanks, and battlecruisers. I find this kind of interesting to have like this really clear a role separation between players because it's not something you see super often in the vanilla part of the campaign. Usually you have players that kind of do everything even if they are not uh, called in a way that would imply that. For example, you have a Zerg player sometime later in the practice campaign that attacks with ultra discs, which is uh, doesn't make sense to me. At least it doesn't make sense to name him that way. Mm. But here you do have this really, really clean uh, separation. Uh, one thing that really sucks about it though is even though you do have that separation and you you have bases designed in a way that's supposed to clearly show uh, what, what each player is going to be doing, uh, they don't upgrade anything. So it almost doesn't matter what units uh, they do build because you can get to free free in this map and I'm not even sure if they get to 1-1. One, one. Let me take a look. Mm, they start at upgrade level 0 and do they research anything else? No, they don't don't upgrade anything. So they just start at 0-0 uh, and they stay at 0-0. This is pretty unlucky because uh, it's going to make those like interesting uh, unit choices less impactful. Actually, uh, I'm looking at the light transcript. It's not even using vultures and firebats. Uh, maybe that's an UEDIP thing then because it's only using marines and raves. Which still keeps it light, I suppose, but it's less varied than I remembered. Uh, it's definitely also not very creative because it only has two attacks. It has, it attacks you with some marines, then it attacks you with some raves, and then it loops. It attacks you with marines and raves, and does everything. So this is pretty boring, <laughs> actually, way worse than I remembered. The orange player is slightly more complicated. He does have a couple of attacks and he does his battle cruises, so this is cool. This is the first time in the turn campaign that you are going to see uh, battle cruises used offensively. Uh, so, hopefully, you remember what they do and take this lesson to heart because you are going to see a lot of them potentially in a mission 10, uh, which is the Hammer Falls in the original game. Mm, and the Inuit IP are not going them to see them in Mission 10 because Mission 10 is uh, something else entirely. It's going to be Operation Silent Scream, which is the second cat mission. 
Hmm. But even then, I'm actually lying because you do have battle cruisers in Science Scream. So yeah, hopefully <laughs> the lesson is you hopefully learn about battle cruisers and hopefully use that knowledge in mission ten when they will appear again. Uh, you start on this little platform, you have to land here, you get a dialogue from Duke saying how he never would have left those add-ons here. Uh, the add-ons are a nice way to like uh, boost the early game a little bit, make it go a little bit quicker. Uh, you have no natural expansions, uh, you have to take out Brown before you can expand, but his base is really huge. Uh, so hopefully uh, once you do take him out, you don't really take to uh, find anything else. But if you do, uh, and if Orange is giving you trouble, you can take this another huge expansion and you will never mine it out, basically. Uh, before you would mine it out, Orange would probably mine himself out twice over, because he has way less resources than this. And yeah, uh, once again, there's nothing scripted on this map. If you destroy everything. There's a dialogue from Duke about how he planted Siameters, but uh, since you are on a space platform, it doesn't make sense. Uh, that's because this dialogue wasn't meant to, use, to be used here. It was meant to be used in Operation Silent Scream, which is uh, on in the city of New Gettysburg, New Gettysburg, I think is the way you pronounce it. So there it obviously makes way more sense. She, here it's tacked on and in UDIP it's removed. Uh, and speaking of UDIP, you can see immediately that we have one more player. Uh, this is because uh, while I really liked, oh let's actually change this, this color to brown. Uh, so that it's easier to teleport. Uh, if you are wondering what this color is in game, this like light cyan is actually black in game. Brown, brown, brown. Okay, there it is. I wanted a third player because I wanted a player that specialized in casters, uh, and I didn't want to make like the themes uh, of brown or orange more diluted. So brown still focuses on light units, which is mostly marines uh, and firebats. Uh, if you play the map, you are going to see like 40 marine attacks, uh, 20 firebat attacks. It's actually pretty scary, even though they are really easy to kill with siege tanks. Uh, if you don't get siege tanks, you are probably going to witness while uh, the reason why Siege tanks are absolutely needed in turn versus turn against any form of bio because bio has an insane amount of DPS. If you let even like three firebats get to your SVs, they are going to instantly die. So you need to defend, you need to be prepared for these bio attacks. Uh, you also need to be prepared for wraith attacks. Uh, he's going to try and go around your base with some amounts of wraiths. Uh, you can see that I kind of piggybacked off of that idea in the original map where you had some kind of dockyards. Uh, you also very much have a similar structure in this version of the map. You have this uh, same kind of uh, battle cruiser landing dockyards thingy, uh, except I tried to make it like a little bit more interesting with some doodads. You can uh, see that I'm still treating with supply. Uh, because I don't want to waste too much space on supply depots. Uh, there, there are certain supply targets that I try to have, and if you see me using like 10 supply depots even though I cheated with this, uh, that's probably because the AI needs more. Uh, so you can imagine that if I have to place four more depots instead of this single uh, uh, power generator, it's going to look even worse than it does here. And I would say that this is already like quite polluted with supply depots. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily <laughs> the amount I would like to see. I would like to see a little bit less. Supply depots are, I feel, the worst supply structure because pylons are like really 
pylons jive well with that types of basis process has obviously because you need them to power nearby buildings so you get kind of this natural distribution uh, where you can have nice clusters of buildings built around pylons but for terrans supply depots are larger uh, they take up visually they're like more noisy so you end up with almost always you end up with uh, really annoying clusters of them if you are trying to start the AI out with a decent amount of supply. I also try to like have some plated off uh, zones for factories or missile turrets on this map. I think this, this looks pretty nice so I just try to make it visually interesting. Uh, here again you can see like platings. Uh, here you have a array of solar panels that goes through this entire base. I found it really interesting visually so I wanted to work with it for a bit. Mm. Here like this entire front facing bunker zone is plated. You are gonna have plated barracks. Uh, you start out this mission the same way you would start it normally. You have this island with Duke's stuff, uh, Duke's stuff and uh, some buildings and some marine dudes and some raves. You can land here and capture those uh, add-ons, except this time around they are placed in slightly better locations uh, so you don't have to land like away from a mineral cluster to uh, have access to those nuclear silos, except here. Here you can actually choose between having a nuclear silo or having a good gas location. And this is because I wanted one uh, command center that allows you to build a uh, commsat silo without you feeling guilty about it. Because you are going to face some raves and you are going to face ghosts later on. So I really wanted you to have an option to build a commsat silo uh, without feeling bad. So this is supposed to be that option. Uh, obviously, if you want to, you can still take this nuclear silo and you can use it to destroy this area. And even better, you can take it initially and then you can relocate to build a commsat station later on. Let's actually check something so that I know for sure that I'm not speaking out of my ass. Yeah, okay, it fits. <laughs> I was afraid for a second that uh, it wouldn't fit because I remember, I think in my playthrough uh, that you can see on my channel, there's a playlist of uh, me playing through all of the missions that I'm talking about. Uh, in my playthrough, I think I might have built a supply depot uh, around these command centers, which made me blocked. Uh, so that was kind of stupid. But thankfully, in UEDIP, you can uh, instantly salvage supply depots and bunkers, which is, which would be perfect for a situation like this. <laughs> Mm. After you uh, have some time to build up, you can try moving out here. This location is much harder to get into normally because Brown now has uh, more siege tanks placed in really good spots. Uh, you can use Duke to deal with them and Duke is really good at dealing with them. He likes to shoot them almost or he can use the Amato to almost instantly kill them. Uh, here, here you will also learn about Yamato uh, dealing AOE damage for sure because not only the enemy is going to use it, uh, it's also going to be a very good tool for Duke to dispose of groups of marines early on. And there is going to be a lot of marines early on. You are going to get hit with like 20 marines by 5 minutes uh, and you are definitely going to need to use Duke to help with that. Uh, I got some comments saying that Duke feels so OP in this map that uh, it kind of defeats the purpose of having having a hero if you have to use him. It, it kind of becomes like a mechanic of the map, which is uh, very fair. Uh, but I think ultimately, uh, which is also what I responded to that comment, ultimately all maps have you use whatever tools you, you have available to win them. And this is just a tool presented to you, right? Even though he is strong, mm, 
you he's not strong enough to the point where you don't need to do anything else he still is like uh, prone to getting clogged down or killed if you leave him alone against goliaths or other battle cruisers uh, so he is a very powerful tool but you still have to uh, play with him uh, play with the thought that he's not invincible in mind uh, this location is very it's like made to made for you to have a feeling that it's going to be amazing to nuke it uh, nuke it and since you get one or two nuclear silos and two ghosts you can nuke it very early and kind of start walking into brown's base off of that if you don't nuke it you hopefully have some siege tanks and since brown has mostly marines and firebats and maybe some wraiths uh, you can deal with uh, the bunkers just using siege tanks and duke and some missile turrets. In fact, you are probably going to need to crawl with missile turrets because uh, by crawl, I mean, if you watch some really long turn versus Terran matches in professional StarCraft, they kind of devolve into this checkerboard checkerboard crawling situation where you have both players building groups of missile turrets uh, supported by tanks over the map and this is probably the easiest way to play this map is if you just build this checkerboard with tanks and missile turrets and move from base to base uh, if you do get enough siege tanks to break into this uh, there's not really much that can stop you you can destroy this and after you do you get this huge base to mine out except this time it's going to be threatened by yellow from the north uh, which is going to be a bit of a problem because he uses science vessels and he uses irradiate uh, so he's going to pick off your pick off your rockets if you uh, don't prepare for that he doesn't start with that many but uh, he does get more after a while uh, so after you hopefully start not noticing that he does pick off your walkers, you may prepare some raves or some goliaths or some missile threats that should dissuade uh, him from this. And for this reason, you have this little zone where you can cram a little, uh, cram a group of missile threats that will be able to kill off uh, anything that flies towards you. Uh, Brown also has a small area with a factory down here this is so that he can kind of try and continue attacking if he still has resources even though he lost his base uh, it's also the case with this uh, star port location if you let him mine uh, for long enough and he doesn't spend it quickly enough on his own stuff he will continue attacking you for a little bit after, even after he lost the remainder of his base as long as he has supply available, of course, and resources. Uh, this location is kind of... Uh, getting into orange is hard because you have yellow here, so by the time you can break into this, you can probably just kill yellow outright, which is typically hard because he has ghosts with lockdown and science vessels and mech supported by science vessels. Uh, and obviously ghosts are stronger in vanilla UDIP, so it's actually really scary to be attacking into a uh, bunker that has ghosts inside. So this area is probably going to be a landing ground for you. And it's a little bit annoying because you have Goliath that are patrolling along all of these walls. Uh, and you have missile threats. So you have to soften this up with some siege tanks. Uh, thankfully, you can place siege tanks somewhere on the slow ground on, or somewhere on the high ground, and uh, they have enough range to destroy these missile threats. You can probably place them here, and they will also have enough range to destroy those tanks, bunkers, and uh, this uh, power generator. After you do destroy them, you can try to get some units up via dropships. And after you do, you can start walking your way towards the orange's main. The idea is that you can get along the wall above his mineral, mineral line and shoot with tanks to kill his workers. 
uh, which is probably the easiest way to deal with him. The AIs in this map don't really have a lot uh, in terms of stashed away resources. So if you do take out their walkers, they are going to be very weak after a very short amount of time. Uh, it, it's actually slightly dependent on the difficulty that you went for in the trump card. Because if you didn't, uh, didn't kill the communication center and you won very quickly, they are going to have a bigger resource stash. And in that case, it might take like a minute or two or maybe even four for them to run out after you killed all the workers. But in any case, it's not going to be a very long time, most likely, because they have a lot of production uh, and not that many places to mine from. Uh, so if you do kill his workers, you can just Sieging, start sieging away at his barracks or his factories from those cliffs and he only has this one ramp here which makes it very hard for him to uh, oh uh, this he only has two ramps okay uh, which is still pretty hard to navigate into if you have uh, if you have goliaths and siege tanks upon the cliff if you have battle cruisers it's a similar story uh, you can fight into ramps very well and wait, actually, do we have battle cruisers on this map? Let me check. Yeah, you do. Okay, so if you do have battle cruisers uh, on ramps, enemies are walking in a straight line, so battle cruisers are really effective against them. They are going to kill Goliaths very quickly uh, in a situation like this. Orange has battle cruisers of his own, of course, but uh, he only has two starports. They will take a very long time to replenish. They cost a lot of money, so it's very possible that if you're actively fighting him, he won't be able to afford any more battle cruisers than what he already had at the moment he started fighting him, which is not necessarily going to be free because he uses them to attack you every now and then. <clears throat> After you deal with orange, uh, yellow is kind of a formality. This area is really the hardest point of his base to get into. Uh, you still have some fortifications al along this uh, corridor, but once you enter here, he has absolutely nothing to defend with. Uh, and anyway, if he even if he had bunkers, they would likely be empty because he would have been fighting for this factory barracks are, uh, factory and barracks in this location. After you destroy anything you get a little pop-up saying that the Confederates are running from the platform and you just win the mission. It's another map where I would say that I'm pretty happy with the way it looks. Uh, it's slightly outdated in so far that there's nothing that you can do on the map without walking into a contested space. That's not really good. Uh, that's something I try to avoid now because it's really tiresome after a while. Um, what I mean is that you need empty spaces between bases where just nothing happens. You need some bases where you can expand or where nothing happens. Because you need that mental space, that comfort that uh, you have some little breaks between uh, moments where you have to be constant, you have to concentrate. Uh, this is not really something that this map affords you, obviously. You can see how much stuff is there. So, if I ever wanted to make it better, uh, I would probably have to make sure that you get some more mental comfort, uh, you get some breathing space uh, and you can actually play this map without going insane because this is definitely very hard and if the previous two maps weren't enough of a showstopper for new players uh, this one definitely would have been the next in line but typically if somebody actually gets here they, they are good enough to be able to deal with this map one way or another.
I think that's going to be everything for this episode. Thank you guys for watching and see you next time.